On July 4th, the museum broadcasted part one of a heritage landmark in London, Ontario, the Infantry School Building. Part two premieres now in focus Additions to the initial footprint, the interior architecture, or more precisely, what is left of it. Built and owned by the Department of National Defense, the interior configuration of the building has been changed over the years, and we actually know very little about what the barracks look like, how the officers' residences were furnished, or the spaces used. At a glance, the general aspect of the exterior does not seem to have changed much since 1888 when the building was completed. However, some de detective-like work and uh, close attention to detail results in a surprising discovery. The windows facing Elizabeth Street on south end of West Wing facade were enlarged sometime before the First World War. Two annexes were added on the east wing approximately the same time, and the roof was restored with significant changes of the initial look. The conversion of the archway entrance from an open space to an enclosed one was not that much of a surprise. It happened only nine years ago. So let's take a closer look. Between 1992 and 1993, an important renovation project was conducted on the canopy in the interior court and the roof, including the tower and the chimneys. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Jason Nye from Defense Construction and Engineering for this information. The roof project included not only replacement of the damaged material, but also reparations sometimes replication of the main ornaments on the tower and on the south wing. An important alteration was brought to the canopy covering the sidewalk in the interior court or parade square. The material and color of original canopy has yet to be determined, but it is confirmed that in 1993 the wooden infrastructure was massively repaired in some areas just replaced. The architectural plans indicate that the first floor windows should have been smaller than the windows on the second floor, west facade facing Elizabeth Street. Two photographs taken most likely upon completion of the building in 1888 indicate that the initial plan was followed except on the north end of the west wing, first floor, where larger windows were built. They seem to be the same shape and size as today. Looking at photographs taken later, all west wing windows are larger, which would indicate that changes were made. The one exception is the window corresponding to the washroom in this part of the building. It is likely that similar changes were brought to the east wing, where we can see that the large majority of the first floor windows were enlarged some time after the building was completed. A walking tour around the building holds other surprises. For example, on the east wing, we can see two additions to the initial footprint with annexes on both floors. The word is that these were some necessary supplements for the men's washroom, but more research is needed to clarify the rumor. One thing is for sure, they were added sometime after 1907, but before 1915, or at least it is what careful observation of two photographs suggests. The first photograph was taken in 1907 and overlooks the east wing which has no addition. The second photograph was taken in 1915, more or less from the same angle as the first photograph, this time showing two annexes already attached to the building. Adjacent to the main building, the way the walls join over the window structures leaves no doubt as to the later addition. Observation of the windows now and then is relevant because changes help us understand the interior aspect of the building. 
Before diving into the particulars, let's just repeat that there were three buildings arranged to form three sides of a square connecting at angles. All three buildings had a basement and two stories above ground. Lodgings for officers were planned for the south wing and the east wing was intended for barrack rooms, kitchen, cellars and dining room. The west wing facing Elizabeth Street included a central entrance with tower. Alongside quarters for non-commissioned officers, kitchens, canteen, prisoners' rooms and hospital ward, there were other amenities such as reading room, recreation room, lecture hall, etc. From a local reporter who visited the building before the 2nd of April 1888, we can form an idea that the intended use on the floor plans was followed with only two rooms on the west wing furnished, but all men's rooms and their kitchen running at full capacity on east wing. Three photographs found by accident in the museum collection give some indication as to the layout of men's dorm and what seems to be the sergeant's mess. These photographs were taken 26 years after the building was completed. They are part of photographs of 18th, 33rd and 34th battalions, number 3 field hospital, 16th field battery. Canadian Expeditionary Force stationed at London, Ontario, Canada by Macintosh Roy Studio in St. Catharines. Then they were produced in late or post-1914 when the respective units were formed. Two of these photographs show the men's dormitory, nothing spectacular with rather minimalist furniture and bed dressings. The third photograph is a site of the sergeant's mess counter with crates of ale from Carling's Brewery, the wooden floor and the ceiling. The space in this photograph is clearly situated on the first floor, too low to be in the basement and the dark con conduit going through the ceiling indicates an upper level above. It could be the sergeant's mess situated on the first floor in the 1886 plans, but the cut and size of the windows does not correspond to the specifications on the plan nor the reality. In the absence of more information, it is hard to confirm which of the current interior spaces at Wolseley Barracks this photograph depicts. Over the years, the interior of Wolseley Barracks has been drastically modified to a point where it is difficult sometimes to confirm which areas have changed from the original layout and how. These changes were di dictated by necessary improvements for access, comfort and hygiene, but most of them are due to modifications to brought to space uses. The most notable change was the museum. The local reporter who visited the infantry school soon after its completion in 1888 spent some time in the West Wing where he visited the museum room. This was one of two furnished rooms, although no museum exhibits were presented. Instead, the reporter enjoyed some piano music played by the musical director of the corps, Private George Shields. The museum room in the infantry school building is significant in more than one way. There is no information as to how the said museum functioned during that time, if it ever reached its designated role or acted as simply another entertainment educational area beside the professor's room or the lecture room. Nevertheless, the idea of a museum within the premises of a military building at the time is unique and precludes any similar attempts in the history of Canadian museums. Also, the arrival of a museum in the west wing of the old infantry school building has marked the history of the building with a complete transformation inside the entire west wing. It is likely that the transformation began in the mid-1950s when the Royal Canadian Regiment first opened the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum on the second floor. At that time, it was more likely just a superficial adjustment to display needs, no massive intervention in the interior space as some photographs of the old museum clearly show. 
to understand what happened in the West Wing, it's better to proceed with a simple compare and contrast exercise of the floor plans from 1886 and today's museum footprint. In 1886, the West Wing was divided in three separate sections, basement, two floors, and attic, with no interior access in between. Under the archway entrance, there was no excavation, which split the basement in two separate components. Completely separate wooden stairwells allowed access between each level. Each of the three sections had separate access points on the side facing the interior parade square or on the sides of the archway. At the north end, a hospital ward was planned on all three levels. Immediately adjacent but separate was the sergeant's mess. On each side of the archway entrance, guard office or officer's rooms, jail cells and spaces destined to fill educational or entertainment purposes, designed on the first floor, on the second, the already mentioned museum room and other spare rooms. The spare rooms could be accessed from the living quarters situated in the southwest corner. These quarters were assigned to the non-commissioned officers. The basement in this area included canteen and workshops. As a result of successive renovation projects, the concept of three independent sections has now disappeared, making room to circa 6,000 feet of this place, square feet of course, on the first and second floors, and 4,000 square feet of collections storage services and offices in the basement and first floor. In the early 1980s, opening of the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum was part of the Regimental Centennial celebrations. As you may recall from part one of our um, production, uh, the RCR had been established in 1883. The main goal of this project was to upgrade this part of the building to the standards of a modern museum and ensure that an HVAC system is available to maintain proper environmental conditions. Also, facilities and elevator were needed for potential visitors. To achieve these goals, major changes were brought to the building inside. A rectangular extension was added on the north exterior wall for the future museum entrance, including an elevator shaft and new stairwell to access the second floor. Two other sets of stairwells and many walls were removed at the same time. In addition, all windows were hidden behind dry walls. From a vision of three separate areas with diverse uses, the space became one single large rectangle. The first floor followed loosely the partition in five main rooms, but the second became a large rectangle split in half along a north-south central axis. This allowed for a loop-like flow on the second floor, which coinci coincides with museum galleries following a chronological sequence of events. Space became available on the south side of uh, the archway entrance in the late 2000 and this allowed for another museum expansion. Yet again, massive intervention and in the, the interior configuration of the space dictated by the requirements to provide barrier-free access for the public to extend the HVAC system almost to the entire West Wing and to enlarge the capacity of the museum foyer. Major transformations were planned and executed. The archway entrance was converted from an open space to an enclosed one. More walls were turned down on the first and second floor mostly. Windows were completely hidden behind drywall on both levels, except current gift, sh gift shop area on the first floor. Consequently, the museum footprint doubled with extended display areas on the second floor, a multi-purpose room, a gift shop and the reception on the first floor. The 1886 uh, Regimental Sergeant Major's quarters, situated on the first floor, became museum office and more walls were removed. 
The result, one single space with large windows, lodging three workstations. A very small part was left untouched, the jail cell block, designed uh, on two levels, in the basement and on the first floor. It is now the only fragment of original building, or at least closer to original, left in this part of Wolseley Barracks. A virtual tour is available on our Clio account, so please feel free to browse the Clio.com. Although the interior space throughout the south and east wings had their share of modifications, they were by far less invasive than in the west wing. We recall that the south wing was destined to officers' quarters and the east to men's quarters. Obviously, the initial plans consider them as living spaces, but this destination has changed, in fact, not that long ago. All of the south and east wings are now occupied by offices, with some noteworthy features to reminisce about these former living spaces for officers and their families. Five apartments still exist on the south wing, completely separate with apparent windows outside and inside. Here is a nice fireplace situated in what was in 1886 identified as a parlor in the commanding officer's living quarter. This other fireplace was situated in the adjacent apartment. The color of the walls, of the stairwells, or of the floors has clearly changed, yet the space distribution seems to be the same as shown on the floor plans. This short video was produced for Historic Places Day, a national celebration hosted by National Trust for Canada. Thank you everyone who accompanied us on this tour of Wolseley Barracks. And mostly we thank Major Brett Griffiths, G3 coordinator at 31 Canadian Brigade Group and Mr. Jason Knight, Defense Construction Canada for sharing information and uh, allowing ac access to their respective offices on the South Wing. We also want to thank Archives and Research Collections Center at Western Ontario University for providing copies of the original drawings of the building. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more informative material coming up. Thank you for watching.